fall down before I die low. How they claim it now on top and I'm a mile up. I know the walls closing in, but don't you dare give up now. Hope believe, give me pull up, do some bucks down. Tired till the valet pull the truck around. Push the line after we drew it, it's just us now. Would you believe me if I told you my granny told me she prayed this? Then booked the surgery just to pull me out of the basement. Right back where I started, nothing to show for a facelift. Got pushed playing Walter White and Davis, never felt so dangerous. The type of power they can't quantify. And name the best from my region, you got a other mind. Think of who really put it on, you never come to mind. Rapping like your Spotify, tap you rappers compromise. Yeah, no need to panic, just paint the canvas. If you can feel the static, you're too close, find your balance. Embed the revolution for they Prohibition band with blood trickle from the lead to see what's planted. I had them all down before I dialed up. How they climbing now on top when I'm a mile up? I had them all down before I dialed up. How they climbing now on top when I'm a mile up? Uh, what at that right to Amsterdam? When my accountant the minus, my family found out too and didn't like it. You're not in the salon with Dale said and I thought he was biased. Then I got a limo that's that copy the finest. Before my foolishness settled in, recorded a whole tape before we got to Berlin. This close to giving up and now never again. Don't overlook the work and come expecting a win. In the end, my word never put nothing over the squad. Got it right up under their nose with the fight of facade. Off the cliff of broken wings, I'm aware of the odds. Enough faith for us all, I'm the one for the job. Most days, catching some rays, baby, look like the front page. Overthinking what they might say, have it your way, yeah. The biggest threat is something they never seen. Dial it up, patch me into the screen. I had them all down before I dial up. How they claiming they on top when I'm a mile up? I had them all down before I dial up. How they claiming they on top when I'm a mile up? What's going on, everybody? Welcome to a special edition of Live and Coffee Current Events and Politics in Luke Bond Nation, the most dangerous show on social media anywhere. And I am really, really excited tonight because I've been wanting to have uh, the folks on who we're talking to tonight for a minute. But, you know, our schedules have been nuts. Um, things have been crazy. And, you know, last week happened. And I figured, you know, when I was watching the news that there was something that the media was not telling people about the history of, um, I don't know, protest, if you want to call it, uh, at the U.S. Capitol. There's a history that they left out. Some of it, um, there's another reason why they don't mention some of the other kind of incursions have happened at the U.S. Capitol. But this particular history, I think, is really important because... See, they don't tell you this happened because then they'd have to explain the actions of this government toward our brothers and sisters in uh, a U.S. colony, still a U.S. colony. Um, but before we get into this, I want to say thank you all so much for joining us tonight for this conversation. Uh, thank you so much for your support. You can find us on uh, Patreon if you uh, like our content, you want to help us out, you want to support us, we would appreciate that so much. You can find us on patreon.com slash Nation. Of course, subscribe to us here on YouTube. You can follow us on Twitter, Nation, the number one, no spaces. And you can like us on Facebook uh, at uh, Coffee Current Events and Politics in Lukeman Nation. And I am going to stop talking because I must introduce to you my comrades at Tele Jaguar, Matt Cedillo, Ernesto Ayala, and Karina Acri Payez. I've been so wanting to talk to you guys for the longest time. Luke Mon Nation, welcome Tele Jaguar. Tele Jaguar, welcome to Luke Mon Nation. What's up, comrades? How are y'all doing? Uh oh. Doing great. Thank you, Jackie. Thanks for having me. 
I'm so, so excited that you all um, were able to join me tonight because like I was saying at the beginning, right, this conversation that we're having about the fascist attack on the U.S. Capitol, um, yeah, what happened last week is important, right? And it's, it's a big deal and, and it's, it's very scary for the empire for sure because, you know, I didn't think they thought a bunch of white people would ever do such a thing. Um, but you know, if they'd listened to us, they would they would have seen it coming. But they didn't. But there's a part of this history about um uprisings that have been staged at the US Capitol that I knew that they weren't telling. And the more corporate media I watched, and these talking heads would say, you know, this kind of thing has never happened in the 220 history of 220 year history of the U.S. Capitol. I'm sitting there like, I think they're leaving some shit out. <laughs> Why are they leaving out? And of course, I'm thinking about the Puerto Rican national who stormed the U.S. Capitol. Um, and I can't remember what year it was. But this is why I wanted you all to tell the story because. I like for the people who carry the DNA of the struggle in them to tell their part of the struggle so that we can find ways to connect ourselves and each other because we all share the same DNA in, in us, the same DNA of struggle. So, so what am I talking about, um, Karina, when I'm talking about the Puerto Rican nationals um, storming the U.S. Capitol. What did that mean? And, and why was it even going? Okay, so um, um, Matt Sadia will be talking. First of all, Jackie, thank you so much for having us on. We are so honored to be here. And, you know, I have been secretly hoping we may get a be able to do it at some point since I met you in 2017, I think. Uh, we did a panel together at American University about um racism oh, in the post-trump yeah. era yeah that's yeah. right so, wow yeah. i did man you should you should have just sent me a message and asked <laughs> <laughs> well you know we're very uh try to be gracious and see if you were unite us but um so yes the the armed the armed um, attack in, was in 1954 by the Puerto Rican nationalists. And Matt Cedillo can talk, a, he's going to talk a little bit about an overview and a broader context. But if you want to start with the rundown of like the 50s and what immediate was the immediate um, impetus to the 1954 storming the, the Congress, um, it's... Um, Oh, and there's a fun fact about Lolita Lebron, which was one of the armed revolutionaries. Um, she was born in the town of Lares, Puerto Rico, which was um, the, very famous for a revolt led by um, indigenous Puerto Ricans against the Spanish occupation in 1868. So this is a woman, you know, that contributes to her, you know, re revolutionary character and image and a little bit more about the critical role that she played amongst the four who stormed the Capitol. So um, against the backdrop of this um, rise in Puerto Rican nationalism, we can kind of hone down our focus to the beginning of the 1950s in US politics. And so the Puerto Rican Nationalist Party in the 1950s was calling for independence from the US government. And they were demanding the recognition of the 1897 Carta de Autonomia um, and Puerto Rico's uh, international sovereignty. So it repudiated the Estado Libre Asociado, which was established in 1950 and continued the colonialism. So they were directly responding to this reaffirmation of US colonialism in Puerto Rico in 1950. And this caused a um, increased tension among Puerto Rican nationalists, obviously, and the United States. So in the 50s, the U.S. granted permission, and we'll think about that language, permission to Puerto Rico to draft its own constitution. Um, what happened with that? Well, the Nationalist Party, which had already been um, facing domestic suppression by the U.S. for the past two decades, 
were outraged by this colonial move, you know, and granting permission that you can draft your own constitution, of course, which would be up for rule by the, the colonial oppressor state, you know, so you could just be spinning your wheels. But mm -hmm. um, when this, uh, the party incited some uprisings in Puerto Rico as a result of this reaffirmation of colonial control. And um, the United States sent um, fighter planes with machine guns to quell the riots um, in Puerto Rico. And nine Puerto Rican nationalists were killed by the United States as they were attempting to quell these nationalist uprisings. Um, and then another key event in 1950 was when in Puerto, one Puerto Rican nationalist attempted to assassinate um, the president um, in, in Washington DC at the Blair House and Harry Truman was living there at the time. So um, the um, two Puerto Rican nationalists were involved in that one. Um, it was a husband and a wife, I believe, or a partners. Um, the woman was killed in the um, at the the scene, and the the man survived. Um, so in nineteen by the 19, 1952, um, the Puerto Rico, Puerto Rico had drafted a um, constitution, and um, eighty two percent of Puerto Ricans supported that. But the nationalism was increasing also behind this, and their leader. Um, Pedro Albizu Campos was in prison at the time, but he was still determined to fight for independence. So simultaneously, he was calling for more revolutionary actions in the United States against the oppressor state. Um, this culminated in a plan um, that was executed on March 1st, 1954, with four Puerto Rican nationalists. They were all Puerto Rican born, living in the United States. Um, their names were obviously Lolita Lebron, which we just mentioned. The second was Rafael Cancel Miranda. The third was Andres Figueroa. And the fourth was Irvin Flores Rodriguez. And their intention was, their intention was to um, go to Congress and um, they brought, you know, lots of arms. Their intent was to die for Puerto Rican nationalism. It wasn't so much to, you know, slaughter everyone. They brought the arms um, to see, you know, whatever was going to happen was going to happen. But the intention was to bring um, the uh, 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 recognition to the plight of Puerto Ricans and what had been happening. Um, Lolita was very instrument um, instrumental in this uh, attack on Congress because the three men that she was with actually got cold feet that morning when wow. they took the train to New York and they didn't want to go through with it. But she told them, that she was going anyway and that she was not alone. And what I think she meant by that is she, you know, she has the the strength and support of her people behind her. So she was ready to go in alone. Um, and the three men uh, conceded to execute the plan. Um, this was a time when there weren't a lot of security procedures in uh, the houses of Congress. For example, they had a student class there that day also. <laughs> so you have these four Puerto Rican revolutionaries walking in um, you know, fully strapped, and they were able to enter the House of Congress from the upper floors. Mm -hmm. um, and what, uh, there are some testimonies from a congressional aide who was, actually that's not the, but he was 16 at the time, he later went on to be a, a congressperson, but he said what it sounded, what, it, uh, what sounded like an explosion of fireworks. So there was very rapid fire, you have live ammunition, um, you know, ricocheting off marble and wood mm. and creating this when that when bullets ricochet against those two materials, it creates like a dust. Right. So you have like sand. Uh oh, I think we lost Corinna for a minute. But, you know, until we get her back, you know, I wanted to um, share this Cosmopolitan article. Is she there? Okay. Well, all right. Well, when, uh, until we get her back, I wanted to share this Cosmopolitan article, and then I wanted to see what you had to say uh, about it, Matt. Oh, there she is. Okay. There we go. So you back. this attack um, resulted, obviously, in their immediate arrest, and the media and the U.S. government was fairly surprised about was docile demeanor when they got arrested. And again, because their intention was not to, to escape, it was to die for people. And mm -hmm. I'll share with you a note that was um, found in Lolita's purse. And of course, she 
expected that, and this would be found in her purse. Uh, but it's a very beautiful couple of sentences wrote, um, which, you know, let's, let's have the, the reason come from her as to why they were there. Um, so let's see. Okay, so this is what the note inside her purse read. Um, before God and my world, my blood claims the for the independence of Puerto Rico. My life I give for the freedom of my country. This is a cry for victory for our struggle for independence. The United States of America is betraying the sacred principles of mankind in their continuous mm. subjugation of my country. So that was to be her note that was going to be found. And um, they were sentenced, all four of them, to 49 years in prison. But the sentence was uh, commuted uh, in 1979 when Jimmy Carter pardoned them and they were released. Um, there are some people that say that this was done as an agreement for release of some U.S. people that were being held in Cuba. But the White House denies that. Um, and so... LeBron was kind of a, a um, be, went on to be a very famous revolutionary independence figure. She went on to, um, she reaffirmed a, a commitment to nonviolence. However, she was very instrumental in continuing the um, Puerto Rican uh, cause for independence. Um, and, and so this is a very sharp contrast to what we saw on 1 6, right? We have a set of, a clear set of demands a lot of organization, the intention. So it's very different, but I, I think we'll get into that or we'll lead into that when you're ready to talk about comparison. That is kind of the the short story of what happened, what built up to that day and what that day in Congress. Yeah, I mean, Corinna, thank you so much for that history. And that history is really important to two things, I think. Um, one is we have to be really careful when we're listening to the media talk about the history of anything in this country um, because they, they lie and, and they leave stuff out. They especially leave like the salacious bits of U.S. history out because imagine if anybody on CNN or MSNBC told this story, then they would have to tell the history behind the story. They would have to tell this let me uh let me see if i can pull this um if i can pull this article up cut that out cosmopolitan and this is in cosmopolitan magazine let me let me know if you can see this uh on my screen uh and this was just published on january 11th uh and it says with the story of Lo lolita lebron we already know what would have happened if the capital rioters were uh uh, by POC, Black and Indigenous People of Color. And there is the compare and contrast of the smiling white dude at the Capitol, you know, the making off with Nancy Pelosi's lectern, having a grand old time. <laughs> and there is Lolita Lebron and uh, one of the other three men that she uh, was with. Uh, they were, as you said, they were arrested. Now, this was done and Cosmopolitan tells the history, part a part of it. They don't tell all of the history of the U.S. colonization of Puerto Rico, right? But they make it clear to indicate that this action was in response to a, a, a massacre that the United States uh, uh, imposed upon the people of Puerto Rico in Ponce. And two decades before this was done. And it goes on to give, you know, the highlights of what you just, the history that you just gave, Corinna. And this is a photo of all of them being uh, after they were detained. Um, it's noted in the article here in Cosmopolitan that LeBron uh, shot her bullets, shot the bullets into the ceiling. Um, she didn't expect to die, but she also wasn't intending to kill anyone, like you said, Karina, she expected to herself, I'm sorry, she didn't expect to uh, kill anyone, but she did expect to die. 
Right. Um, but she was arrested. So, you know, when we look at um, this, oh, you know what? I just, I just realized you couldn't see uh, all of that. There we go. There's a picture. There's the article. Still trying to figure out how this restream business works. <laughs> <laughs> So here's the article in Cosmopolitan Magazine of all places, just wild. Um, and this is the headline. It was published just on the 11th, a few days ago. There's a picture of smiling, stealing lectern guy, you know, in his Trump regalia, having a grand old time, walking out of the U.S. Capitol with Nancy Pelosi's lectern. Trust me, I don't give a shit about Nancy Pelosi and her lectern. That's not even the point. Um, and whether he stole it or not. But the contrast between what these people did on, on Wednesday and why they did it with what the Puerto Rican nationals did um, in 1974. Uh, no, I'm sorry, in 1954 in response to a U.S.-led massacre against pro-independence protesters in Ponce, Puerto Rico. Um, we have to be clear that Puerto Rico, and again, that article is in Cosmopolitan Magazine of all places. I don't know when Teen Vogue and Cosmopolitan got politically astute, but it's been pretty great to see uh, the stuff coming out of uh, Teen Vogue, at least. And it was, it was a nice surprise seeing that coming out of Cosmopolitan. But you know, when we look at why um, Lolita LeBron and those four men did what they did, Matt, at the Capitol, yeah. and we compare it to why these Trump supporters did what they did last week, we, the, the, these, this is not something that can be compared at all. I mean, yes, Lolita and her compatriots were sentenced to decades in prison, um, and their sentences were commuted, and that's fine. But it sure is taking the FBI a good amount of time to find all these people um, that were in the Capitol that they have incredible surveillance for. And, you know, they they have access to everyone's social media. We know they read that our social media posts, they can find us if they really want to find us. I mean, what, what do you make of that? What? Well, I well, like, you know, what I would look at when I want to look at what happened at the Capitol, I would compare that more to um, kind of like the, the presidency of, uh, of Andrew Jackson, right? So mm -hmm. Andrew Jackson comes into power, and before him, everyone preceding him was either one of the founding fathers, signatory Declaration of Independence, or the son of a founding father, right? So everyone before this is kind of seen as part of this like new aristocracy. Andrew Jackson is seen as a man of the people, he's seen as different. Now, obviously, Trump's not that, but that's how he's perceived for some reason. And so like this kind of violent frontiersman, dirt under the fingernails, we're going to get mud all over the White House, kind of we're going to tramp our boots everywhere. Um, that actually happened uh, in, in the, during, the, the, during the, the presidency of Jackson. He actually opened the White House up to, to you know, these, these, these guys to tramp their mud all over the boots. And they weren't poor. I mean, they were the president. But that, that actually happened to read the book of uh, Ed, Ed Baptiste. He writes about it. Mm -hmm. so that's why I would compare them to. But now, when looking at looking at what happened with Puerto Rico, now that is rooted in a completely different history. Um, I'll, I'll, get, I'll go over it really briefly, but like in, in just just to look at the the history of the colonization of Puerto Rico, the Spanish invaders first come to Puerto Rico in 1493, and it takes some some time to establish kind of uh, you know colonial government there. In 1508, Ponce de Leon is the first Spanish you know governor, this dictator of Puerto Rico. Um, within three years, in 1511, there's already an uprising, right? Wow. Um, you go, uh, Korean touched upon the, the uprising in 1860. So this is even before the Spanish-American War. And uh, during the Spanish-American War, uh, what comes out of that, you know, the Spanish-American War, much like the um, the Russo-Japanese War, are kind of setting the stage for World War II. These are the inter-imperialist wars. These are the wars of the industrializing nations to colonize the world, right? Set the stage for World War II. I'm setting the stage for World War One. The, the stage for World War Two, which sets the stage for, you know, the world we live in today where America's dominant power. But in, in that time, what was going on was that they were, they were, they were, the, 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 Span, the, the, um, the America was driving Spain out of its colonies so they could get access to both the resources and the markets that Spain was holding. And so what came out of that was they, they got Cuba, Guam, Puerto Rico, and the Philippines. Now, in many ways, Guam and the Philippines 
much like Puerto Rico, are still dominated by U.S. capital. Uh, an example of this, a basic example of this, is that uh, the Philippines is one of the world's largest importers of rice. Now, the Filipino Ooh. people, you know, that live in the Philippines, they've been eating rice since you know people have lived there. That's part of their staple of their diet, right? But yet they find themselves importing rice for some reason, right? Because oh, they're dominated by U.S. capital, right? Um, uh, similar situation in Guam. Uh, there's military bases everywhere. There's military bases everywhere in in, in the Philippines. Now, in Puerto Rico, there's an even more there's an even more direct colonial stature, though, because the Philippines and Guam they get no, nominal freedom. But but when the case of Puerto Rico, it's still very much held in, as a territory, so it's a very colonial status. So in 1920, they passed something called the Merchant Marine Act, uh, which which you know has wide implications, but specifically to Puerto Rico, where this prevented was uh, the development of any kind of like uh, um, their own their own industry, their own um, shoring industry, their own, their own ability to control their shores. Now, if you're an island nation, the ability to do that is, is really, you know, it's, it's, it's going to be hugely detrimental. And in addition to the fact, so, so all the imports that were coming in are, are hit with an extra tariff. So it's really, the cost of living in Puerto Rico is very high in comparison to the wages, right? So it's, it's like impossible to get anything started. Now, in addition to the fact that it's costing them so much to import food and costing them so much just to live, um, U.S. agribusiness before that Spanish agribusiness enforced monoculture on a monoculture on the soil, so that Puerto Rico became this place where you grew sugarcane. Right mm -hmm. now, the most famous probably uh, instance of monoculture in, in world history uh, that led to disasters is the Irish potato famine. Right, so Ireland didn't grow potatoes um, that was forced upon them, but then eventually, because potatoes don't really grow in in the in the eastern hemisphere, um, that caused the everything to go bad and people to die. And right, so similar situations all throughout the world happened. Right, all throughout the world. And so the monoculture was forced in Puerto Rico, monoculture of sugar, same thing in Cuba. And so these are the kind of conditions they found themselves in, in, in as early, you know, in, in this new period of American colonization, 1920. Well, as early as 1922, the, the Puerto Rican National Independence Party was formed, right? Uh, within that, a man named Campos, he rose to power. Um, I always get his first name, I always butcher his first name, but Campos, just look it up, Campos. Mm -hmm. He comes to power uh, of the of the national the national Puerto Rican uh, leadership and the, and, the, and the organization takes a completely different turn, much more willing, militant term, much more willing to bear arms, much more willing to really, really fight this thing out. Uh, and under his, under, under that direction, um, you know, all these kind of, they have all these kinds of battles uh, with, with the government and, uh, and that, uh, that is the party that Lolita LeBron joined and that kind of sets the stage mm -hmm. for why that was happening. So but this, this history begins before that massacre, before that, it begins with the very colonization of Puerto Rico. It becomes with the, the slaughter of the Taino people. It begins, it begins with this, you know, 500 year history of stolen lives and stolen land that defines so much of life on the Western hemisphere and the attack on the capital or the whatever you want to call it, the capital, looting of the capital, the 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 the, the, the sullying of the cat, whatever that was, also is rooted in five hundred years of stolen lives and stolen land. That is a celebration of it. That is a, that Jacksonian type of like, you know, frontiersman kind of like get her done kind of kind of kind of um spirit. Um yeah that, that pushed that. Um and it is what it is. Yeah, I mean, I, I gotta tell you, when you said get her done, I was like, you know what? When I was watching this on the news, I actually, I, I, I was like, I think these people are down there talking about get her done. Let's just get in there. Yeah, let's get her done. I swear that is exactly like the attitude that I feel like a lot of them had. And I, and I hate to say that because I'm a country girl. I, I was born in a little town in Jarrett, Virginia, 90 miles south of Richmond. And that's country. That's the look. That is below the Mason Dixon line. That's country. It's the South. But that's not a stereotype. They're 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 like that. A whole lot of them are like that. And it was just it, it I mean, it was funny to watch with that like soundtrack in my head. But I, I mean, yeah, I definitely see like the the um the 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 Jacksonian influence in in, in their thinking like, you know, Jackson slaughtered indigenous people under this manifest destiny idea that all of this land was white people's because they were white people. Because, you know, look, look, the indigenous hadn't done anything with it. We're going to do more with it than these, you know, savages will. And I, I mean, there was, I, I couldn't help but hear or feel that vibe 
Ernesto, when I heard people say things like, um, you know, this is our house. And, and the one guy, was, and I actually did laugh at this. And, and I, I was like, I was on the phone with my family because my family, they were like, you are not going down there, are you? I'm like, oh, this, is, this, is, this is right on right crime. Why would I go down there? I'm going to let these people work out their little issues amongst themselves. I'm not going down there. They don't trust me. They don't pay me enough money to cover this kind of thing. Um, but as I was on the phone with my dad, I, I, they, they talked to the, some reporter was talking to the guy who said, into the camera, this is our house. We built this. And I was like, mm, I don't think so, dude. <laughs> But I don't know, Ernesto, what, what, what were your thoughts on that whole fascist uprising at the at the Capitol? And from your perspective on the history of indigenous and, and you know, Raza, the Raza people, what does this even mean? Yeah, uh, I, I do remember I, I heard that clip as well. And I was like, well, I mean... You didn't build it, actually. <laughs> I mean, you, I guess his, you, it is yours because it's your nation, but you didn't build that. Someone that's a good else. Point. That, that somebody else built that, actually. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, you know, um, you know, seeing that happen, you know, you have this this group of people. Uh, Ang Anglo's, European Americans, you know, uh, the people that have that self describe themselves as Americans, as the Americans, you know, you have this group of people who who uh, this nation was built for, you know, it was built for them on our backs, you know, on our backs with our labor, uh, as they, and so they're used to that. After so many generations, they're used to just seeing that, you know, and, and that's the and that's the only thing, you know, and, and within the past maybe. 30, 40, or 50 years, you know, there, we, we have grown in, in numbers and in, you know, population, you know, both the, the, the Rasa and, and African people, you know, we have grown in numbers that they're just not used to that. And they don't want to see that, you know, because it, it totally, it scares them because see the United States, the history, the actual history of the, of the United States isn't this like glorious, you know, search for freedom and, and emancipation or whatever. No, it, it's a, it's the story of 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 uh, European invaders that built a nation by by uh, subjugating other peoples, you know, and, and subjugating other nations, and even in that in that same process, creating other nations, you know, and that's that's where you know the Chicano people come in, you know, they, we we're a result of all that, you know, we're a result of what not only what Spain did to us, but of what twenty almost you know twenty years after that, you know, when we thought we we had kicked out the, the colonizers and they just came back, but speaking English, you know, <laughs> and, uh, you know, so, so yeah, you know, exactly like you were saying, you know, like, you know, I, I was seeing that and I, I mean, obviously, you know, the first thing you're like, well, we would have never even gotten that close. <laughs> never. Yeah. You know, if we would have tried, you know, we, we wouldn't, we, we would have tried, we would have died. <laughs> it didn't rhymes. Yeah. You know? I mean, the, the, the funny thing is like, when you said we would have never gotten that close, like when I, like when I first saw them, you know, surge past the bar barricades and whatnot, I just thought about how, like, when we went down to um, the there was this big, the big, big Black Lives Matter rally that that was down there, and we marched past the Capitol, and and like we knew that we could not go on the steps. I mean, that's just that is just like the rule, and and. If you can walk on the little plaza, but you can't go up the steps. And if you go up the steps, a Capitol Police officer will appear out of fucking nowhere and, you know, sternly remind you to get off the step with their hand on their gun. I know this because I've done it a couple of times trying to, you know, um, one time with my dog's fault. I, it's, it's, you know. but, but I mean, I, I just remember like the, outsized police presence in those areas where they did not want us to be at all. And it was just crazy to me to see all these people 
um, so easily. Like the fight over the the uh, partition with between the cops and the people, and I'm looking at these cops just like lose this battle over this uh, 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 crowd barrier. And I'm just like, y'all ain't even trying, are you? You're just you're really just not trying to suppress those people. Like I know you can. <laughs> you know? And and it just I think everybody, every person of color who has ever been in any demonstration against the this the, the police state, the government, you know, any type of injustice understood on the sixth that that we would have never gotten the kind of uh um I I don't want to call it great because that's not we wouldn't have gotten the kind of treatment that they got that they that they received. A lot of us they'd still be you know washing our blood off the stairs. Oh, yeah. And that, I mean we, we all know that's true. And I was writing when you were talking, Matt. I was writing some notes down because when you said um, the monoculture that was pushed on. Um, on Puerto Rico and on uh, Guam and on the Philippines and and on uh, even Ireland. Here's the connection between our struggles. This also happened with Haiti. This is also the reason that Haiti, one of the reasons that Haiti is, continues to suffer economically because Haiti, like uh, uh, Puerto Rico and like the Philippines, had their own farming culture. They relied on their own farming uh, pro produce. And uh, Phil Winter over here in the chat said, Jamaica too, the same thing. Anywhere you find US imperialism, you will find that the United States has imposed these laws banning countries from, uh, uh, from using their own manufactured goods or produced goods and forcing them to import U.S. or other goods from other countries, basically making these people pay for stuff that they could produce themselves. And they also they also do this thing where they where, where they say that look at the world is starving, right? And we're going to do something to help to help feed the world, right? Mm -hmm. but they actually end up imposing these monocultures. They actually end up imposing. I think I mean I remember looking this up one time. Philippines was the world's largest importer of rice, and Thailand was the world's like largest exporter, something like this, right? And you have hungry people in both these countries, right? And and then you have one country where the rice is being taken out. One country where the rice is being prevented from being born uh, or being grown, so that Cargill, a company based in San Francisco, can make money. I mean, that, that's essentially, you know, when you when you follow all the little lines, what was happening in that in that in that scenario. So, I mean, you know, these scenarios going on all over the world, like you mentioned, you mentioned Haiti, Mexico. I think I believe today is this the world's second largest importer of corn. Mm -hmm. You know, and this is like a, the staple of the of, of this diet that has existed for thousands and thousands of years. So, I mean, there's just a, again and again and again and again across the world. And Puerto Rico is no exception. That, I mean, that that was in, in, in Puerto Rico. In fact, Puerto Rico might be an exception because it's just so bad there. I mean, it's so horrible in the way in which, you know, the industries are prevented from being born. I mean, Haiti is another great example. I mean, Haiti might as well be a direct colony in, in a similar vein to, 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 to Puerto Rico. I mean, the amount of the amount of the, the, the import export kind of deals that they have there to, to just prevent an economy from being born. And then they the point at the place and be like, look at this place. It's so poor. Right but now, the greatest, the greatest, the greatest example, counter example we have though, is in that same area of the world as as, as Haiti, the Dominican Republic, Puerto Rico. You have a place called Cuba. Mm -hmm. and in Cuba, you don't see these kinds of problems, mm -hmm. and there's a reason for that. Mm -hmm. That's right, and and it is the struggle against imperialism, U.S. imperialism this time. And I think that that was the other thing that I made a note about. I mean. When we talk about the fight against imperialism today, of course, the, the, the focus is U.S. imperialism because the United States is the bully on the block as, you know, as far as you, imperialism is, is concerned. But they weren't the first. I mean, there was Spanish imperialism and colonialism. There was uh, British imperialism and colonialism. There used to be a saying about the British Empire that the sun never set on the British Empire because it spanned across hemispheres. That is not the case anymore because as all empires go, they become, they acquire so much property and so many colonies that they literally can't support them anymore. And they can't support them monetarily, but they also can't 
uh, withstand the constant uprisings against the empire that always happens in empires. Why come? Because people don't like to be lorded over by some foreign entity telling it what to do and not having uh, a self-determination for their own people. That's historically just true. So, you know, we have this, we see this, um, this uh, uh, long line of a struggle against imperialism in general in Puerto Rico and the United States is still imposing uh, modern day colonialism and imperialism on Puerto Rico because they're still a colony. They're, they are not a state, right? Yes, that's um, correct. And again, we saw um, a very, um, uh, horrifying example of colonialism unveiled in Puerto Rico after the hurricane that devastated them and left, right. you, know, um, you know, that was another, a gross reminder of you know, that colonialism actually looks like having people sitting in, um, you know, in uh, for months and months and months um, with damaged homes, no rooms. And on that point that you just mentioned, um, Jackie, I found a quote by Huey P. Newton um, that's kind of relevant to this, um, the tie into the uh, a common struggle against colonial powers. He says, um, in uh, 1917, when the Russian Revolution occurred, there could be a redistribution of wealth on a national level because nations existed. Now, if you talk in terming an economy on a worldwide level, on an intercommunal level, you are saying something important that the people have been ripped off very much like one country being ripped off. Simple mm -hmm. reparations are not enough because the people have not only been rob robbed of raw materials, but in wealth accrued from investments of those materials, an investment which has created this you know, technological machine. Um, and so the people of the world are gonna have to control that you know, at some point. And so he's talking, I think about the need to understand that the United States is not just really a nation anymore. It's a global empire, right? So right. in that sense, we have to understand what I think he means by how the world is hooked up. It means to recognize that a capitalist imperialist ruling class and is, that is now transnational. So in that sense, the U.S. is not just anymore, but a global empire, right? We have a small group of ultra-rich capitalists who control the wealth and all the systems of communication and media, as we're seeing right now, public spe or speech has already been privatized, you know, mm -hmm. on social media mm -hmm. platforms, right. and the overall means of production. This can't, you know, exist forever in contrast with uh, the interest of humanity, you know? So um, this struggle to control generates anarchy and chaos at times as the system, you know, is ultimately going to collapse. We know the capitalist system has so many internal contradictions that the way it's not going to, uh, you know, implode upon itself at some point, um, as it is already actually doing now. So yeah. I think guess that's what the revolutionary intercommunalism is, is about, that we can talk mm -hmm. about, you know, the need to to develop that. Um, and one yeah. thing, Jackie, that you mentioned with the Euro-Americans when they came to the, I, one thing I think is something that we don't mention fairly often is when Americans, European Americans came to the U, to this hemisphere, mm -hmm. they didn't just come to steal land, right? That wasn't right. the only thing they had to accomplish because mm -hmm. they also had to smash a communal system that they That's encountered right. here. They had to mm -hmm. smash a communal system, a communal ethic in order to make themselves successful. And then ironically, within light of, you know, the how we're descending into more and into more and more on this chaos before it gets better. And I, ironically, a return to the communal ethic is what world po populations are going to need to survive this, you know, uh, crisis that is going to become more and worse, even if it's for, a, a, you know, any any kind of time, even for a short time, a return to that communal ethic is going to be what is required. And so we have 
as the I think as the system becomes more and more out of control and you know it's just exposing itself worse and worse, which is why you know Trump is bad for the brand and he had to be mm. replaced by mm-hmm. a little bit more decorum for the U.S. empire, just a figurehead and Biden, right? That's mm-hmm. why we have a great window of opportunity now to as the the you know the system the capitalist system is being you know more and more exposed we have an opportunity to build that revolutionary communalism with um african nation with chicano nation with raza all the mm-hmm. the oppressed peoples the nations that are here and and see that's why this was it was important for me to have this conversation um now, because I I just feel like, and I don't know how, how you guys feel about about where we are like, in the, in this struggle, but I just feel like if we don't get our collective, intercommunal, international shit together quick, like we are we're all in a struggle, and we have a, a a lot of work ahead of us, but we have got to get connected on the issues that affect us all that are interrelated to all of our struggles because that's the only way we are going to be able to have anything like a, 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 a coalition or a network that is going to be able to prop anything up of value when the system finally does fall and i feel like it's closer to falling than we realize but I don't know how you guys feel about I it. it. I want to say something. Touch on what Karina was talking about a minute ago. She talked about, you know, this accumulation of wealth that's going on right now. Mm-hmm. During the pandemic, Elon Musk has increased his fortunes by one hundred and seventy billion dollars. Mm-hmm. Right now, now he did not do that by selling Teslas. And he did not do that by selling SpaceX or, or space. He did that because there's a speculation on what his wealth could be, right? Mm-hmm. This, previously unheard of this type of uh, uh, gaining of wealth um, and not actually being a successful business person. I mean, like define success. Yes. They're ripping, they're, they're, they're exploiting they're this or that, but Henry Ford sold cars. You right. Know, uh, uh, Carnegie sold his steel mm-hmm. or sold oil. I mean, he guys, mm-hmm. they sold their product and that's why they were, they were, they were, it was vicious. It was cruel. It was wrong. It was murderous. I'm not saying it was good. I'm just saying, but they actually had a, finished product right they had products that people bought right no tesla is elon musk is not what he is because of the amount of cars he sold he Mm. is what he is because we live in a time of fictive capital we live in a time where the derivative market is 12 times the size of the world product we live in a time where things are just made up and under those conditions they will kill you for any reason in order to maintain a world of rich and poor because the old way of capital relations is breaking down because Production is being automated. I mean, production is being being automated, and the sole source of value under a capitalist system is the exploitation of the individual worker. I mean, of the, of the worker, of the of the workers individual, and of the collective of the workers. Right? That's being removed. And under those conditions, where people are just billionaires because we fucking say so, that means you're gonna fucking die. That's mm-hmm. what I mean. We'll fucking kill you because this whole thing is bullshit, and and it makes it so much more unstable. The fact that Elon Musk can like become the world's richest man for no reason. For no reason other than he like sounds cool or he sounds cool to them. You know, he's a he's the cool kid amongst the 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 the, the Silicon Valley set, right? He's the one that seems the coolest, seems the most Steve Jobish, seems the most like think different kind of kind of guy, whatever. And he could be elevated to be the richest man on basis of not a non this is not the same, this is not like Henry Ford 2.0. This is completely different. And under these conditions, it's completely un, so much more unstable. The future is so much more uncertain. The the, the 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 guiding logic is so much more absent. Um, these are going to be very very scary times up ahead because we're looking at the connection of worker and and and, and owner in a way that's going to like you know explode the future. Um, and they're trying to maintain the the world of rich and poor, right? And that and that's what's going to happen. And so uh, you know we need to fight. We need to seize the means of production. We need to. We need that. Whatever is produced, we need to own it. Uh, you know, national. You know, things need to be nationalized or internationalized or what have you. They need to be owned by the people, or the people will die. Not the people will be exploited. Not the people will have horrible lives. Right. Not the people will be. You know, the people will die. So that's kind of you know, the the stakes are rising. You know, it's crazy to me what you just said about Elon Musk and the way people thought that he was cool because 
You know, I always thought that, you know, and I understand that Americans are incredibly propagandized and we don't know good entertainment or good art if it literally like punched us in the face repeatedly and said, you know, I am actual art that we just, that's, that's what we think art is. It's like something that, that, that uh, shocks us and, and, uh, uh, you know, is, is extremely provocative and is messy and, and, you know, and, and I feel like when, when Elon Musk did his little like pot smoking thing on, what was it, Joe Rogan's show, I just kind of felt like y'all just don't, you don't require much, do you? I mean, this is, <laughs> this is it. Like, like in my day, and I, I got to, I, I'm starting to sound like my mother. It's just really, I feel so awful. But I mean, I'm 53 years old, but you couldn't just be cute, right? Like, Billy D. Williams was handsome, but if he had opened his mouth and he had like a Pee Wee Herman voice, that would have been that. No, that would have been done. If that man could not dance, if he couldn't lay on the charm, like, you can't just be cute and like capture the attention of all these people. But it's like these people, that's all Elon Musk was. He was just edgy. He he was just really like edgy. And not even in a way that was actually edgy. It's like you're sitting on a YouTube show, smoking pot and telling really bad jokes. And, and that gave him this cult following among young millennials that let them be that, that caused him to let him get away with saying shit like, we can do whatever we want. And talking about the coup in Bolivia blew my mind. I was like, that's a whole other level of propaganda right there. That's that's some slick stuff. But but let me let me get to this question about propaganda and the way we propagandize, even with our history. And and Ernesto, I'm wondering. I, I want to hear from you. Like Trump, his last official trip was to go down to the Alamo, uh, go down to the southern border, and to go down to the Alamo. And I feel like the history of the Alamo is, of course, told from a very uh, uh, Euro-American, very American first American exceptionalism perspective. But we don't get the significance of the battle that the Alamo was in and why we should what why we should stop just talking about remember the Alamo. I remember the Alamo because all the white people died. That's I'm just like and whenever somebody says that to me, I'm like, Do you want to know why I remember the Alamo and smile fondly? You know, but that's what you tell me why, uh, why we should really remember the Alamo for what it was. Because the wall didn't work. We jumped <laughs> over that wall and we kicked her ass. <laughs> you know, I mean, I, I think, uh, you know, the, the animal is a, a perfect example of how we, we uh, you know, and we're talking about propaganda and the way, you know, uh, history in the United States is, is taught. You know, this whole notion that, that we're one, one nation, one nation under God, you know, they even made us do the Pledge of Allegiance when we we're kids. You know, and, and that we are, we we all somehow share some, you know, common, common uh, origin and and common present and common future, and we don't. You know, you know, again, it's it, the United States is built, you know, by taking from here and here and here, and then even taking people away from their homeland, to make them slaves here, you know, and even that the way they 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 frame that they say oh, all the slaves. No, all the people you made slaves, you mm -hmm. know, not the, the slaves as if, you know, African people were just slaves just out of nowhere, you know. Um, but, and it, you know, it's, it's that whole that whole history, you know, uh, the United States came here and 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 imposed itself on a, on a completely separate nation that was trying to develop, you know. And uh, and so they, they, they teach this contradictory history, you know, that that. Uh, you know, oh, I remember the Alamo when we Americans defended liberty and all that, and and that, that's completely the opposite. I mean, 
And and they even they even say it as in as if they even won that battle. They lost that battle. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you know that you have those pictures of you know uh, uh, Davy Crockett all heroic, like killing ten Mexicans with one with one bayonet. Wiping everybody, you know, but the, the, the Mexican account of that is that he died groveling in, <laughs> in, uh, you know, pleading for mercy. And they were like, no, <laughs> man, he, he, did. Did. he should have, he should have, you know, and, 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 you know, these people, you know, these, these defenders, the, what they were defending was that you know the the history is that you know they they would whatever was Mexico you know back then you know and, and you know the, the Spaniards left but you you know we still had you know some of the the criollos you know the the Spaniards born here in power you know or the lighter skin quote unquote mestizos which you know mixed uh, people uh, and so they were in charge right but they they were west a little more you know. With Oh, you ducked out a little bit, Ernesto. Oh, that they were they were you know trying to uh, increase the population of the Southwest, mm -hmm. you know back then. So the Mexican government allowed for you know these uh, European Americans to immigrate into what was then Mexico, you know, which was Texas was you know right there on the frontier. Mm -hmm. uh, you know these people came, and they were you know supposed to obviously follow Mexican law, which. One of the main things Mexican law said is slavery is illegal, right? You know, because you know, and this is you know, uh, I think something that we're talking about. You know, what are what are the common things we have as a people? Is you know, the people that that are considered Mexicans today were slaves to Spain. You know, we were slaves to Spain. You know, mm -hmm. we have the, the missions. You know, the missions throughout California, even right. in Texas, those were you know slave camps. You know, and then, you know, they're all the way throughout Mexico and down into Central America. You know, these missions were slave camps, you know, where they forced people the same as, as they did to Africans in, in the Southeast, mm -hmm. you know, forced them into labor uh, or into, you know, working the land or whatever, uh, and then just die as like animals, like, you know, shadow, chattel. Uh, so, you know, that was outlawed here. You know, that was, that was outlawed here before the United States ever outlawed slavery. You know, there was still slavery. And what was obviously because you know you still we still had this or they still had the civil war over there, um, uh, but you know they, they they conveniently erased the fact that these people kept coming in and bringing people as slaves and and the Mexican authorities said no you you can't do that man stop you know you, you're gonna stop doing that or or you can't be here, and so that you know just like these people storming the Capitol oh my God our freedoms are being denied wow you know, that oh oh I can't believe it you know and and. And they, they I'm so oppressed because I can't have my slaves. <laughs> I, can't, I can't have my slaves. Oh my God! I want. I just want my freedom to have slaves. You know, and 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 that, and even even the way they worded there, they fought for their independence. How can you fight for your independence if yeah. you're invading another country? You're not fighting any independence. You know, you're, you're just a, a crybaby squatter that wants their way. Does that sound familiar? <laughs> That's true, though. And and I I hadn't even thought of it like that until you just explained that that way, Ernesto. That the settler colonists, who yeah, they were invited by the government of Texas for whatever reason to settle there, um, but just didn't want to follow the rules. They they came there and they're just like, yeah, we know what the rules are, but fuck that. We want to do our own thing. <laughs> and it's the same thing here. I mean, these people, they are angry because for two reasons. Because basically, like you said, Karina, capitalism has failed them. Capitalism has failed people miserably. And these folks know that, but instead of uniting with the anti-capitalists and the anti-imperialists like ourselves and working class, poor and oppressed people. No, they want capitalism to work right again. Yeah, <laughs> right. So they're not gonna, they're not gonna, they, they understand what capitalism is and they don't care that capitalism crushes and oppresses, uh, oppresses working class and, and poor people. They want it that way because that's how they make their money. They just want to keep making their money. So, so that's why they decide, okay, fine, you know, we'll, we'll participate in 
uh, in this electoral process. But, you know, we didn't get our white supremacist capitalist savior to fix all this stuff for us. So now we're going to tear down the symbol of capitalism that isn't working for us, not not that they don't have freedom. And, and the other part of this was the whole <clears throat> the whole mask thing. Yeah. Closing businesses was had yeah, hurt their bottom line and right. workers lost their incomes. But instead of being angry at the government for not providing support for people, these people are mad at the government because the government shut down businesses and told them to wear a mask. Yeah. It's like they're, they're white supremacy and, and, and settler colonialism and manifest destiny propaganda in their brains could not get them to make that three one quarter step toward you know what capitalism sucks <laughs> you know this is this is why why isn't my government providing for me in this unprecedented time it was instead it was like well the government isn't doing anything so let's so it's everyone else's fault and let's go storm the capital not asking for anything no demands I, I would have had a tiny bit of a little teeny tiny bit more respect for them if they had gone <laughs> up in that joint with some demands like, listen, y'all go. I mean, if somebody had had a, you know, look, while we're in here, hold on. I got I got some demands right here. Let me read them. And, you know, pulled out a bullhorn and was like, look, we want those checks, <laughs> you know, and make them retroactive. And, you know, do this and do that and provide PPE for the people. But no, no, they just smeared shit and piss all over the place. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, and, and, it's, and it's not like I'm mad that they did it. It's just like you could have stayed home and did that. <laughs> yeah. And then, you know, and, and listening to you, um, just talk about that right now, Jackie, it just kind of strikes me as how. Um, you know, schizophrenic the, the the American mind is because then you have you have the people that just that you know are on the one side storming the capital to retain their you know mora their morality their human dignity because they are they are entitled to all the things that manifest destiny prescribed and they are fully you know engaged or are fully committed to the idea that the American dream exists and it's for them and they have to demonize somebody else right but on the flip side of that you think they're you know what this the state is going to do now is they're going to use that liberal revulsion against Trump to pass through, you know, for, and his MAGA followers to pass through legislation that is far more worse than anything Trump could conceive. Mm -hmm. And that's going to be, you know, the, um, and the, that's going to be the linchpin of fascism right there is through the liberal bourgeoisie, just as Mark said, you know, that's the way it's going to happen. And, um, you know, and then John Lewis said something very interesting today on your show, Jackie, that he did or that you did earlier. Mm -hmm. um, he said that um, he said the U.S. developed a governing model that masks the reality of the dictatorship of capital by instituting a system of limited democracy. But the economic collapse of 07 and 08, the rise of Trump and COVID and the Trump rebellion has forced the ruling class to reveal itself. So you have this you know, paranoid schizophrenic episode of, a, you know, an inverted a system of inverted totalitarianism and the empty shells of democracy. And it's like, you know, it's like the Wizard of Oz, you know, like the wizard is panicking now. Like something went wrong in his control, you know? Yeah. 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 I mean, that's exactly right. It's like, uh, no, Matt, go ahead. Well, I just wanted to point out that, you know, like in, in the 1930s, there was this thing called uh, the bonus act, you know, uh, these, uh, these veterans, uh, you know, they went to Washington to get their get their check, right? Um, what they were owed, and you know, they were, you know, almost. almost oh yeah, the bonus army. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Our bonus army. Yeah, and and, uh, and Hoover, you know, he set the National Guard on them. You know, um, you had Occupy, which you know was multiracial, but you know, there's a lot of white people in Occupy. Uh, after a while, you know, the cops came down. They threw down the batons. I mean, they did here in L.A. anyways. 
Um, you have, um, you know, the battle for Seattle, which was almost all white, and they were getting gassed, you know, when they were, when they were fighting Israel. So, you know, even if you are, I mean, it, 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 yes, white people get away with a lot more in this country. White people get away with murder in this country. White people get away with all kinds of shit. Um, and, and the government is, is less likely to, to strike you or they're going to give you more, have more patience with you, even if you are opposing them, if you are white. But at the end of the day, the reason they were able to get in there so easily, it, yes, it was because they're white, but it's also because of what they represented. You know what I'm saying? Mm. It's because mm -hmm. they represented that. I mean, even in, even in, I've seen I've seen all kinds of protests here. And, I mean, not, like these counter protests. I don't even know what to call them. I've seen like little MAGA rallies, like miniature MAGA rallies in NLA. And what they tend to do out here is they want to put the people, uh, the non-whites, whatever, in front, right? The little diversity thing in front to show. <laughs> yeah. It's really good here in LA to do that, right? So I've been yeah. I've been told to come I to like, go by blacks for Trump, of the eight eight, yeah. and Latinos for Trump. They're like, you know, you're 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 the coconut. All kinds of weird. Where so that's yeah. what they try to do, and the cops don't harass them either. So it's kind of like it really. It, it's not just you know it, what you represent matters. It, it, you know, like it, guess how you look. Guess how you how you are. Yeah, that's gonna that's gonna determine a lot in your life. But also like what you represent and what you do matters. Who you are and what you're putting into the world matters. And a lot of the reason they were able to get in is because, you know, there's an element of this society that, you know, is saying, like, hey man, havoc, wreak havoc. Fuck, fuck this like veneer. Fuck the decorum. No, we want the pure fucking havoc. Now they are outnumbered by people who are like, no, 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 decorum's a better way because you know it's it's better if everyone's just asleep when we do this, right? And I think you know what Karina was talking about is really what's gonna happen. Well, we're gonna see over the next few months is taking down of high level fascists, high profile fascists, you know, a couple here and there, mm -hmm. um, but the systematic attack on the left, the systematic attack at every level, you know, of, of like, of, of, of how, you know, from the big ones, the mid ones, the little ones, to, you know, the, that that's what we're gonna see, where all of us are gonna get shadow banned or whatever they call it. All of us are gonna have like trouble. A lot of us are gonna get unpublished. I mean, a lot of us are gonna get harassed. I mean, it's gonna, our lives are gonna be hell. Um, and it's going to come from all kinds of people, and it's all going to be done under the guise of a return to normalcy, unity, a time to heal, enough divisiveness from the right and the left. Mm -hmm. you know, enough, enough. It's time to hug. It's time to you know. It's time to time to come together. It's time to re reunite. It's time to bring us together. What makes us all Americans? That's what's going to happen over right. the and next four or five months. It's going to be horrible. And we've seen it before, you know, we've seen it. We saw it with 9-11 with, you know, Biden, who always loves to brag about he, how he was, you know, he's bragged many times that he was the author of the Patriot Act. You know, the, the, the schizophrenic state produces the crisis and then it sweeps through all this draconian legislation to take mm -hmm. down our civil liberties. And, um, you know, I, it is going to get worse before it gets better. I, I think we have to realize that i mean well of course people who are you know not going to brunch right now we know that <laughs> we know how it is when it when a deporter in chief is in president we know what happened during standing rock we know who saw that mm -hmm. there's um you know we know that the president is merely a figurehead of the state and the second he becomes bad for the brand and the second he gets a little too unruly he will be removed you know yep. yeah. um, and I mean, and that, that's what Trump did, right? right. I mean, let's, let's be clear. No, no, nobody in the ruling class cared about Trump's xenophobia. None of those people cared about those babies in those cages because they didn't care when Obama built the cages to put people right. in in the first place. So, yes. And I know a whole bunch of folks watching who are like, oh my God, she's talking about Obama, but I'm never going to stop talking about Barack Obama. <laughs> because that man... Not, not to say that more than any other president, he was a charlatan, but he was the best charlatan in my lifetime that both part of political parties put forward that duped us all. I mean, a lot of people, like that first term, I, I'll always tell people, of course I voted for Obama that first term because I really believed that he would be different. And, and even though I probably didn't understand some things you know, the depths of imperialism and like I do now, I knew that there was something wrong with American militarism, right? I knew that there was something wrong with uh, the war machine and it needed to be reined in and we're spending way too much money on, on, on war and all that kind of stuff. <clears throat> and, <laughs> and even when he, I will never forget this, even when he 
did a he 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 had a, a speech in front of an audience in um uh it was either Philadelphia or Camden, New Jersey. My husband's my husband's hometown, Camden, New Jersey, where he basically gets up in front of these black people and like finger wags at them about raising their kids and you know oh yes yeah yeah and was, I mean, you know the pulling your pants up and this was when he was campaigning but then when he goes to Iowa and where all the white people are he's talking about policy and and even then I was like well why can't we get the conversation about policy we we want some policy too but you know, we're like, yeah, maybe we just got to get him elected and get him in there. Maybe, maybe, and then two years later, I stop saying maybe, and it's like, oh, fuck this! What the hell? <laughs> what? What is this? <laughs> he's, the only difference between him and the rest of them is he's black. What? So, I mean, and and that's a conversation that a lot of people don't want to have. Yeah. But it's still to to this day, and, and I think that carries over into Biden's administration, because Biden is seen as less frightening than Trump. But Biden's policies are Trump's policies, are Obama's policies, mm -hmm. are Bush's policies. The policies have not changed. Only thing that's changed is people who is moderating them a little bit, left or right. To appeal to whichever base, you know, that they're, they're trying to appeal to. Um, I forgot what I was going to say because I got sidetracked and pissed off by Obama, which Joe happened. Biden like, <laughs> Joe Biden is a figure that's probably, even rhetorically, right, probably to the right of Richard Nixon. And mm -hmm. so it, that's true. Is, yeah. Important because, because this is what the result of this good cop, bad cop game is right so like trump says mexico is sending drug dealers and rapists you know that guy's a bum punch him in the face you know that that son of a bitch is kneeling he needs to love this country um this is the china virus he's saying all these really horrible things right okay uh -huh. joe biden comes and says hey man you can't go to a 7-eleven unless you have an indian accent you know hey you know like when i was you know when I was a pool guard or when I was a lifeguard, I almost got into a fight with this uh, <laughs> this, this bad dude, you know, and he was, you know, corn pop. Corn was, pop. Yeah, so he's talking the story about, like, how he's going to, like, beat up a black teenager when he's, like, a 30-year-old man or something like that, right? And that's, yeah. like, to show these got credibility. So this guy coming off, like, Clint Eastwood from Gran Torino or something. <laughs> right? That's uh, one of my uh, favorite movies, by the way. Well, yeah, but he's like, you know, that, that's, that, that's Joe Biden, right? He's like, he's like Clint Eastwood from Gran Torino. Is seen as a lesser evil to Donald Trump, and I can understand why because Donald Trump's actually saying like, "I'm gonna, you know, like get you, you sons of bitches." Okay, so this guy over here is the lesser evil, but this guy is more evil than like Nixon, you know. So, so the, 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 and in reality, they're all they're all evil, but like just rhetorically, just what you're saying, right? The the fact of the matter is, you keep playing this good cop bad cop. The both the worst the both the, the worst the both cops get. It just, it just keeps going. They go together. They move together. They move. In, in synchronicity, they move alongside each other. It yeah. gets worse and worse and worse and worse. The longer you play this game of like, well, at least it wasn't that. <laughs> at least it wasn't that. At least it wasn't that. The longer you, the longer you stay on this train, the train's heading one direction. Okay. Yeah, that, that's definitely true. And uh, Ernesto, go ahead because yeah, I think you're going to pick up on where I, I, I got sidetracked by my hatred of Obama, but. <laughs> No, I mean, it goes along with what Matt said, but I think some, you said uh, you made a real good point earlier, you know, about uh, these these uh, these Looney Tunes storming the Capitol is, you know, they 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 want capitalism to work, you know, and, and they you know, all, all this rhetoric about, you know, make America great again or the liberals saying, you know, uh, uh, take America back and all that. Uh, you know, they're, they're they're alluding to this this period in time, you know, after the, the world wars, you know, and, and all that time where the, the government, you know, the, or the, the Western government, the Western governments had to concede a bit to, you know, worker movements and stuff like that, because otherwise they, they were, you know, there were, there was a potential for revolutions, you know, or, or, or much stronger social movements led by workers uh, that was bought out, you know, that was bought out. Yes. But, you know they're alluding to that. You know, and and they're in that that type of world. You know where they imagine the white picket fence and suburbia with a dog and 
and you know a, a brand new Chevy in the garage or something, you know that that world is gone. That that world is impossible. It's impossible to sustain that world, you know, uh, by by exploiting and and destroying so much so much of the rest of the world, you know. So, but they want that fantasy. They want that fantasy to continue, even if it's just a fantasy. They want it to continue, and 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 it's impossible for that to to happen, you know. And and we don't only see it, you know, within the United States, but you know, even internationally, you know. I mean, with, from in the 2000s, you had you know the the rise, and you know there there was a rise back back, you know, a push against them. But you have the rise of like you know revolutionary or socialist or left leaning uh, governments and movements in in uh, the rest of the Americas. You know that that pushed back because they they had a chance. You know, uh, a push back against imperialism. You know, in Venezuela. You know, and and Bolivia, Ecuador, mm-hmm. well, a bunch of countries. You know, Nicaragua still there. You know, Cuba. Obviously, you know that that stayed strong. It's been staying strong as much as it can since uh, the, the the late fifties. Um, but you know, we we have this world that that you know it. We can't have that. That fantasy is 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 non-existent. It was like fake. You know, but these you know, these people want to keep perpetuating that that happens, and the only and, and so the the ruling class of this country is split. You know, they're split on whether you know you have the people on the well, I mean, they're all on the right basically, but you have the people on the extreme right, the Republicans, you know, and even more extreme, the Trump, the Trumpicans, that 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 want things to to work the way they have worked so far. You know, mm-hmm. white. People are the are, are the majority white people say and everyone else follows if you don't like it too bad for you you got you better figure out something you know shut up or die or go away or something mm-hmm. that's impossible. that's not happening anymore there's too many of us you know you have the other side still on the right but the liberals the democrats who are, who have a little bit more of a brain you know they're still imperialists and horrible people but they they kind of understand the world a little more obviously for their own interest but they understand, hey, we got to sprinkle it with a little bit of right. color. We still put, put some rainbow stickers on it. Mm-hmm. Because if not, if not, the inevitable will come much quicker. That's what Trump did. Trump was making the inevitable come much quicker. Right. And, and, and and so these people, they're, they're a little bit more smarter. That's why they, they have the Obamas or they have the, uh, you know, the uh, like here in L.A., we had Villarregosa as a mayor. Mm-hmm. And, you know, now, you know, how you have this, uh, you know, cabinet that Biden has and it's, it's all oh, people of color. Oh, my God. You know? And, and you know, you have you have this facade, which is still still, you know, white, white uh, supremacy. It's still imperialist, mm-hmm. it's still, you know, capitalist. Obviously, it's not going to change. You have you know, and, and they push, you know, this 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 old old man that keeps talking about socialism because they know that rings that rings a lot more in, in the people today. And, and but he uses it like a like a shepherd to you know bring people right back to the Democrats and continue having this faith in 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 the empire and and you know this this, this fantasy is it's not happening it's can't it can't happen anymore you know and that's just the the, the reality and, and the sooner we come to understand that the sooner we you know we will be able to to solve all of these issues that have plagued our people for hundreds of years you know and and all of these issues that that stem out of the United States that that plague the entirety of humanity. We're, you know, until we 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 come to understand and realize that, you know, we're not going anywhere. You know, we're gonna keep playing this little game, and these guys are gonna keep saying, you know, uh, because the only way the only way they can keep this empire alive is by going right, mm-hmm. is by by having the capitalists, you know, assert more power and 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 you know, crush whatever social movements they can, and and try to crush whatever you know. Uh, independent identities from the oppressed and and try to do all this stuff and, and you know mask it in progressivism and liberalism and whatever but that's the only way the, the the empire can survive by doing that and but little by little pushing to the right you know oh we, we have a biden who doesn't say you know straight up racist but well, he does i guess but he, he doesn't say it as much as trump well, there, that's the perfect example look he, he he actually, cute little stories about little black kids caressing his blonde leg hairs at the swimming pool and cockroaches somewhere i don't know where the cockroaches came in you know they, they keep going right and right and right because that's the only way that the united states can survive but you know they get us in this little game of oh it's gonna work this time, you know. <laughs> and how how many how long how how long are we gonna keep saying that, man? It's, it's like you know we see some some very intelligent people out there, you know. And every four years they get duped into this game. It's like, come on, sisters and brothers, 
<laughs> but you know what? I, I knew you were going to get to that point that that get me back to where I was before I got distracted by you know my hatred of Obama. He does that <laughs> every time. He just distracts me. I think about how much I just so disappointed and just angry at that tool of U.S. imperialism and capitalism, um, and and how easily he just played on his blackness, knowing that it was all just just full of shit. But anyway, you know, the, the idea that the reason those folks were able to get the the uh, uh, disproportionately lighter treatment from the law enforcement on hand, aside from the folks who were cops and former cops and off-duty cops and firemen and, you know, military in that crowd, but they weren't challenging the status quo in, in that crowd. They were they were mad that they didn't get their white supremacist savior. They were mad that, you know, that that um that they were mad that or over over a lie about the government election. And and the crazy thing is these are people who have never cared about actual voter suppression of black and uh, uh, other people of color that the same GOP has committed. But all of a sudden, this guy says the election was stolen and they believe that absolutely and they go storm the Capitol over that? Really? I I mean, it, it's... But, but you know that even them doing that, as much as these politicians say, oh my God, we're so afraid now, they're really not afraid that anything is going to change because these people didn't go up there to actually change anything, you know, because I think in their heart of hearts, they're, they're pretty, I think they pretty much knew that they weren't going to get them to declare Donald Trump president <laughs> to stop the Electoral College uh, 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 validation and declare Donald Trump president. They knew that they weren't going to be able to do that, but it, it did. I think prove as as, a, as an instructive practical activity for future, you know, kind of uh, uh, kind of things. But but here's the thing that I think I, I think blows my mind the most. Like most of the people in that crowd, y'all, were not poor working class folks like us. They were. I mean, you know, I see a lot of people. You know, looking at these folks, oh, look at all those poor MAGA supporters. Y'all have never been to, to D.C. and seen how much it costs to stay at any hotel in Washington, D.C. Even in the middle of this pandemic, you, you, you can't stay. The Holiday Inn in downtown D.C. is damn near $200 a night. So, I mean, it might be, what, $150 a night? $120 maybe because of the pandemic? But because it's near the inauguration, it's right back up to market rates. So these are, I mean, and, and the hotels are full. Trump Hotel is full right. of his supporters. There are all these high priced hotels around the city that are full of these people. Yeah. These are not, these people are not poor. They've taken private planes. They've, you know, flown here. Yeah, there is a smattering of working class folks, small business owners, but most of the people in that crowd uh, are business people, mm -hmm. they're in the business class, they're the petit bourgeoisie, or they are capitalists who really are just angry that they were told that the system, uh, you know, isn't working for them the way they want it to. And instead of, um, no, no, what I, the, what I was trying to, what I, the point I was trying to make was, but that's the reason they were let off the way they were. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like, like they, yeah, there were some instances where the police were wailing on a few folks, but mostly, you know, the police were like, you know, helping the ladies gingerly down the stairs that they weren't taking even supposed selfies. to be on. <laughs> Doing what? Yeah, taking selfies. There was yeah. the one black cop. I watched this on CNN when they aired it, and they have not posted it again, but I saw the picture of it on the Daily Mail website of the black. Capitol Police cop who had on a MAGA hat, he was in uniform, had on a MAGA hat. He's talking to four or five of these Trump supporters. One of them flashes his badge to this dude. 
And this 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 Capitol Police cop, this Capitol cop with the MAGA hat on is saying, well, you know, if you could just help me out with getting some of my people out, then, you know, that would be really great. The fuck are you talking about? You are asking me? Are you sick? And I'm like, I'm sitting there and I'm thinking to myself, clearly I've had too much wine and I need to stop drinking. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I only had one glass and it wasn't even the whole glass I had only had <laughs> half a glass and I'm like what did I just hear did I just hear this cop ask these people who literally just stormed the damn capital if you could help me get the cops out of the capital that would be great when I, I mean so I look at that and of course I, I'm 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 there's no way you can look at that and, and not come to the conclusion that yes, law enforcement was in on it in more ways than one. And I don't care what the media comes to a conclusion with and you know conjures up. I don't think they're going to be able to cover this up like they have before. I, th I think they're going to have to offer some folks up um, who they find who have been complicit in it. Um, but there's no way to come away from, from looking at something like that without coming to that conclusion but oh, sorry. no go ahead matt i think it's really important for everyone out there to really like I, this is my opinion but i think this is why i think people how i'm approaching this these people don't rich or poor or whatever um they the people that support this kind of video they don't believe in anything they don't believe in things they want things mm, oh that's a and great it's just it's just it's, just, it's, just, it's that it's that straight up they don't actually believe in things so trying to reason with them it's it's like you know it, it it doesn't work. There's no point in trying to reason with them. This is there's just no point in trying to reason with them. It's just just, just avoid them, defend yourself from them if you have to. Mm -hmm. it's just there's no they don't believe in things. You know, like it, it's not really it's not fruitful. They, they don't because if they believed in something, they need something else. But they don't really believe things. They they want things. Yeah, they want that's this. That's a great. This. That's a great and point. That's that is a perfect point, and I think that's a perfect way for me to sum up my long and rambling trip to where I was getting to. That That is the thing. It's like, they really, yeah, the politicians are frightened, you know, because their workplace was overrun by, you know, these yahoos. But they understand that these people literally have no intention of actually changing a damn thing they are doing. They're, they're, these people don't pose a threat to the system as it exists. And as it is going to continue to exist, we're the ones who pose the threat to the system. And it would have been a threat to the system if any number of those folks out there stopped and said, you know what? <clears throat> we would be so much more effective if we organized with the folks on the left. You know, maybe the election was stolen. Maybe it wasn't. I don't know. But. I'm kind of mad that the government left us out to dry. But hasn't the left been mad that the government left them out to dry for a long time? Maybe I should go talk to them and see if we're mad about the same shit. But they knew that they weren't going to do that. They knew they weren't going to do that. No, None of those, but the, you might get one or two who are going to have that realization that we've got the same enemy. But mostly, like you said, Matt, these people want things from the government. They want their tour. They want their government to work for them like it had work, worked before. Um, and that that's why they're they don't pose a threat to the status quo. Um, so, you know, ultimately, <clears throat> I think tonight this conversation that we have had about the history of of struggle of Chicano, of, of Raza people is so interconnected to the struggle of Africans uh, in this country, Africans abroad. There is no way we can talk about the struggles of any of us against capitalism and imperialism and not come to the conclusion that we're all under the same boot. We are all under the same boot and, and there's no way I can get free and expect, well, let, let me put it this way. I can't see myself getting free and leaving somebody else under the same boot. 
that's a weird ideology that is that has surfaced in the past couple of years uh, centered around reparations that I swear to God, I just don't understand short of people don't know their history. But when right. you talk about the history, like we did tonight, and you see the connections in the history, then those arguments literally disappear. So, I mean, I'm gonna leave you all with the last word. You know, this. I, I hope this is not the last time you guys are gonna come on our show, because this has been so oh, much yeah. fun. <laughs> it's been so much fun for me. Um, and there's always so much more stuff that I can, I'm thinking about all the other things that I want to talk about now. Um, but oh, I'm gonna leave you guys with, yeah, I'm going to leave you guys with the last word. I'm going to give you guys each the floor and say whatever you want to say um, from Tele Jaguar to the, to the folks, to the Lukeman Nation family. And um, yeah, take it away. Uh, well, I'll first, um, you know, I, I uh, first of all, I want to thank you for having us on. I really appreciate it. Um, this is this has been this has been a great you know great time spent. Um, I got three real quick points. One is like okay, if someone's full of shit, you don't owe them shit. So like you know if someone's unreasonable, you don't owe them reason. So all those people, if you're trying to engage with them, don't. There's no point. Um, I would encourage your uh, when we talk about the other thing we we're talking about was like kind of this uh, the, the the liberal whatever. Uh, I would encourage your your listeners to watch uh, a video from 2016 from the DNC. A uh, speech by uh, General John Allen at the DNC. It is the most ridiculous explosion I've ever seen of this type of ideology. He has a whole gathering of a diverse America. He's got Sikhs. He's got you know black people. He's got Mexicans. He's got Puerto Ricans. He's got Chinese. Everybody's like, and we're here, and we're Chinese, and we're Puerto Rican, and we're gay, and we're straight, and we're this, and we're America, and we will stand up to our enemies. And so like it was the greatest like uh, expression of a. A rainbow coalition of death that I've ever seen in my life. It was so wow. concentrated. It was just like wow. so I would check I would encourage everyone to check that out if you really want to think see what, what this big ten imperialism is all really about. Um mm. this inclusive imperialism. Um the other thing I and the last thing I would say is um thank you so much for having us talk about on to talk about Puerto Rico. Uh one of the great honors of my uh my career as a writer and as a poet was actually that I got a chance to open up an event where Oscar Lopez Rivera was speaking at just oh, after the oh. And uh, I actually ended up writing a poem that was dedicated to him and I actually got to read it to him, like, well, like making eye contact with him. And that was probably, oh, wow. um, to this day, probably the most. Uh, okay, um, I got chills. The biggest thing I've ever got to the, 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 the most, like, <laughs> I, I can't in my life I've had. So that was, uh, you know, obviously the Puerto Rican, uh, the Puerto Rican independence struggle uh, means a lot to to means it's a lot to us as Chicanos and to, to the world, uh, uh, the people of the world. I mean, because it's one, it's one of the great freedom struggles uh, that we should all be in support of, and it connects to all of us. Also, they don't want you to know about LeBron for the same reason they don't want you to know about Rob. For the same reason they don't want you to know about Tatarina. They don't want you to know about the people who had guns and got away with it and survived and walked away. <laughs> that, that's what they really. Do. That's it. Mm -hmm. Oh, and Matt, um, you you are an author and a poet, so please tell people where they can support your work. Oh, uh, go to flowersbooks.com. Uh, well, uh, say that again because you broke up a little bit. Um, you can look up the book uh, uh, "Mowing Leaves of Grass," and and flower song will come up. Go to that website and you get the book there. You can on Amazon, but don't give Jeff Bezos any more money. Um, it's flower oh, song press. Not books. Flowersongpress.com. Buy Mowing Leaves of Grass, and uh, and, that, and that's where you can get the book. So so please support that. Uh, support the press. It's a great book. doing a lot of stuff. And and again, thank you so much, Jeff. I really really appreciate it. Absolutely, my pleasure, Ernesto. Yeah, you know, again, th thank you, thank you, sister, for having us on. You know, it's always an honor that uh, you know uh, we're able to to share space like this with with. Uh, fellow sisters and brothers, you know, and I think, you know, uh, with everything that we're talking about, you know, we're, we're, you know, we're, you know, like here in this program, we're, we're African, we're Chicanos, we're talking about Puerto Ricans and, and, and all this, you know, I, I think uh, that shows how the, the oppressed and colonized can, can talk about each other and, and not be in conflict, in fact, be in unity, you know, and, and that we can decide for ourselves, you know, all, all these, uh, all these issues that supposedly become issues in between our people and, and you know we we fight each other and all that you know those are those are imposed those are you know imposed on us by someone else you know that those aren't even issues 
you know, uh, in reality, we get along, you know, and, and historically we, we've fought side by side and, mm-hmm. and picked up the rifle or, or arrows or spears or whatever. We picked up rocks and bricks or whatever and fought together, you know, uh, that's the history of, of our peoples, you know, so, so, you know, it's a, it's a, it's an honor to be here. You know, thank you for, for letting us come on. Uh, it, you know, it's also an honor to talk about the, the, the Puerto Ricanos and the, you know, the Boricua people that are such a valiant people that, that have fought and, and given an example uh, to us, you know, uh, uh, in general and, and as Chicanos, you know, um, there's always been a, a lot of solidarity between both peoples, between both nations, I should say, you know, um, it, there's, uh, you know, I was, I was looking it up last night and, and I saw, you know, these old pictures of the, the young Lord's headquarters and they had Zapata on it, you know, Mm-hmm. And, uh, and then I, I looked up, you know, some of the newspapers and they, they had like whole sections dedicated to Chicanos and they would say from Aslan, you know, uh, you know, Aslan is what we call the, you know, the occupied territory of the Southwest, you know, uh, and, and they're, you know, they were giving space and they even had, you know, obviously space for, you know, news from uh, African people, the Black Panther Party in particular, they had, you know, all these different articles, but, you know, we, we were able to, 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 uh, to work, you know, and, and create despite whatever they tell us on, on the media and they try to pit us against each other, we, we historically have. So this is another good, perfect, beautiful example of that. And, you know, thank you for giving us that space. And, and to my Boricua, Puerto Rican sisters and brothers, Palante. Palante indeed. Karina? Thank you, Jack. Um, I think I would like to remind our audience that no matter who is in office, if it's a Republican, if it's, mm-hmm. Uh, a Democrat, Biden, Trump, we have the same two choices every day. And that is whether we choose to live under the dictatorship of capital or or whether we choose to organize for a worker-led revolution. And as I said, we have the opportunity now as the crisis of capitalism is becoming unveiled and, uh, you know, the uh, schizophrenics of the state are, are, you know, uh, pass all these draconian as we can expect. Um, it's really important for us to um, build our own platforms to combat the corporate. That's the reason we formed Tele Jaguar. That's why your show is so important because we have to our own community led uh, news media and analysis um, collectives in order to combat this and help to. Um, educate and have these kinds of things where we can, um, you know, uh, get to a point where we are re- recognized that this. Uh oh. She dropped off again. Oh. I know she'll be back in just a second. So uh, let me go over here and read a couple of the comments until uh, uh, Karina hops back. There she is. Oh, there you are. Oh, okay. Thank you. And you know, check us out there and build community led. Uh, um, you know, take a, a step towards community led journalism. Use the platforms that we have for as long as we have them. Get your email in case of a, a um, uh, you know, a social media blackout. Get an mm-hmm. email list. Get study groups in your neighborhoods. Get people's addresses so that we can have ways to stay in contact with each other in the case of a media blackout and support community media, support Luke Mon Nation. And, and thank you so much, Jackie, for having us on. And we hope this is a, the start of a, a relationship where maybe we can feature you and your husband one time and we'd love to um, continue this kind of dialogue. Thank you for the opportunity. Uh, it, this was absolutely my pleasure and I wish I had done it sooner, but I'm glad I did it in this moment because I, I couldn't let this moment pass without having you guys on and talking to you. And I'm so glad that um, you came on and we we took this time tonight. Um, y'all have been great in the comments. Dust said workers and oppressed peoples unite. Well, Dust didn't actually say that. Dust James, uh, V.I. Lennon actually said that. <clears throat> and that's <laughs> one of the things that we, um, we do in Lukman Nation. We are anti-imperialist, we're anti-capitalist, we're socialists, we are pan-Africanists. We're internationalists. We are anti-war. We are anti-racist, anti-sexist. We are against the oppression of all people. We fight and work for the freedom and liberation of all people.
through working class struggle around the world. There is no other way it is going to happen. And we just happen to be it literally in the beating heart of imperialism, Washington, D.C. So we know that we have to fight all the more harder here, <clears throat> excuse me, because this is where all of the decisions and power moves are made that affect our brothers and sisters around the world on every continent. So if you all enjoyed this video, and it looks like you did over there in the comments, uh, please share. Uh, please introduce your friends to our comrades at Telejaguar um, and uh, like us on Facebook, uh, follow us on Twitter, subscribe to us on YouTube, and you can find Luke Mon Nation again on Patre Patreon. I always forget how to pronounce it. Patreon. Uh, dot com slash Luke Mon Nation, L U Q M A N N A T I O N. Thank you so much, you guys, Matt Cedillo, Ernesto Ayala, and Karina Acri Payez for joining me tonight of Tele Jaguar. Will not be the last time, and thank you all so much for joining us, for watching us, and for supporting us. We appreciate you very much. And as always, as we've been saying for years on here, hey, Nate, what's going on? Uh, you hop in at the last minute to show yourself, bro. It's good to see you, though. But as we've been saying for years, uh, as uh, um, oh goodness, I just lost my train of thought. I, I need to go to bed. As Fred <laughs> Fred Hampton said, I say to you, peace if you're willing to fight for it, and we are having to fight for it now. Peace, y'all. <clears throat> I had them all long before I dial up. How they claiming they on top when I'm a mile up. I had them all long before I dial up. How they claiming they on top when I'm a mile up. Uh, I know the walls closing in. Don't you dare give up now. Hope and leave, then me pull up, do some bucks down. Tied to the valet, pull the truck round. Push the line up that we drew it. It's just us now. Would you believe me if I told you my granny told me she prayed this? Then booked the surgery just to pull me out of the basement. Right back where I started, nothing to show for a facelift. Got pushed, pushed.